Okay. Uh, this next panel, um, I think the, the last panel really expertly set up a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in this panel. Because this panel is, um, we're focusing on teachers and educators from different regions of the country who are facing organized opposition to teaching quote unquote difficult districts. And this opposition is sometimes from state legislators, sometimes from district school boards, sometimes by parent organizations, this you all know. But the topics that we talked about that, that maybe individuals will address, not everybody perhaps, but is there a way to fight this? I mean, there's not a way for an individual teacher, for the teachers yesterday in Florida who were talking about their travails, they, they can't by, I don't think, the Koch brothers, but are there ways that individual teachers and groups of teachers can take actions in their schools, in their communities? That's maybe what some of these folks on the panel are gonna talk about. Also, um, what is it about the American public schools that makes teachers so vulnerable? And, how do we galvanize community support for teachers in the face of the resistance that teachers are facing? And you know, an interesting one to me is there's a lot of people say that we should, you know, revive, we, we should have a, we should be able to fight back in a big picture way. The teachers should find ways to fight back. So I think a real in, 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 in small ways and big ways, what would that fighting back actually be? If teachers were going to do that, if teachers were going to organize, how did they actually fight back? So those are going to be some of the questions that we're going to deal with today. Um, I was going to, I have a list of questions a mile long, but I think rather than me asking that at the end, after our panelists are all done, I'm just going to turn it over to questions from the audience and, and you can ask what you want to ask. All right, our first presenter is Ed Donnellan. He's a teacher at Gonzaga College High School in Washington, D.C. And um, Ed has been teaching high school history for, somebody yesterday was talking about 40 years. Ed's been doing it for 39 years. Um, Ed, you lost out by one. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Ed lives in Baltimore, and for Ed, teaching the history of slavery took on a greater meaning when he led a group of Gonzaga students on a three year journey to research Gonzaga's historical ties with slavery. Um, where he worked with the Georgetown University Archives. The students read 19th century financial records that showed the school was built with profits from Jesuit run slave plantation in Southern America. So um, the students identified the enslaved persons who worked at the school. And as Ed's going to point out, that reckoning with the history, this difficult history, this hard history, has been challenging and is continuing to this day. Ed. Well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Professor Blake for inviting me to be here today. It's, it's truly an honor to be part of this, this conference. Um, and I gotta give a shout out to Daniel. Daniel, I'm the guy in the high school that, that the IT guy can't stand. When he sees me coming, he runs the other way. So I appreciate, I appreciate your help today. And hopefully, hopefully we're ready to go. So this, this is kind of an amazing story that I'm gonna share with you today. It's the story of Gonzaga's reckoning with its history with slavery. And students are at, the, are at the center of this story. I want to make sure you guys see that from the beginning. This story began when I read an article on the commuter train to DC by Rachel Swarms in the New York Times, discussing the sale of 272 enslaved persons by the Jesuits in 1838. I was working in a Jesuit institution. I did a year of service in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. I had never heard about that. And this is just six years ago. So I went back to school that day, I emailed the professor who was interviewed in the in the article, you see him here in the slide, Professor Adam Rothman. And here's one of the great things about this story. 
I invited Professor Rothman to come to Gonzaga. He agreed to come. And here's another extraordinary part of that. During the question and answer, a student stood up and asked this question that I believe is the most consequential question ever asked at Gonzaga. Are you aware of any connections between Gonzaga and slavery? Professor Rothman paused and then said, you know what, I don't know, but I do know where you can find out if you want to look. And he challenged us to come over to, Gonzaga, to, to the Georgetown archives that summer to begin our journey. I want to begin with that document that lists the names of the 272 persons sold by the Jesuits in 1838. It's truly an extraordinary document. This is the first document we asked the archivist to bring out to us when we, when we began our research. And right from the beginning, we had questions. This document was laminated. My students wanted to know, why is this document laminated? And the archivist quite somberly told us, this, arc, this document is of great interest to the descendants of those 272 people. And when they come to Washington, D.C. to try to find their ancestors, so many people, when they located the names of their loved ones on that document, began to weep that they had to protect this document so they wouldn't be destroyed. So here we are here. These are, these are action shots in the archives. All you, all you historians know this. I, I just learned this a couple years ago. There you are. You, you're just digging through these 19th century uh, accounting books. And we came up with some questions. Did the Washington Seminary, which was the founding name of our school, Gonzaga, directly or indirectly benefit from enslaved persons or slave labor? Was the Washington Seminary involved in any way with slave-run plantations? And did enslaved persons work at the Washington Seminary? I want to just show you a quick picture of the school where it started. The school opens up on F Street between 9th and 10th. There's a picture of it right around the corner from Ford's Theater. It would stay there to the mid-1950s. Our first, our first objective was to learn more about the history of the Jesuits in slaveholding. And I want to show you a quick map here of Southern Maryland. You talk about a shock here. I found out, we found out, that the Jesuits were the largest slave owners in the state of Maryland and one of the top nationally. And you can see on the map there of Southern Maryland, in red are the Jesuit-run slave plantations, including White Marsh, modern and, and current Bowie, Maryland, St. Thomas, Newtown, St. Inigo's, and up in the upper right, uh, Bohemian, Cecil County, Maryland. We saw documents discussing them buying and selling people as, as early as 1793, and I think it went back even further than that. So talk about pushback. Our pushback wasn't always political. It was from people who had deep roots at Gonzaga and were, were, were struggling with this, with this uh, information that we were bringing out to them. The first pushback was that, and we've, all, we've heard it in, during the weekend here, Ah, these are just benevolent slave owners. These Jesuits were good to people. They made sure they went to church on Sundays. They made sure they were well fed. Well, we heard about a Jesuit from Ireland named Peter Kenny. And we heard that he had taken a tour of these plantations in 1820. And we asked to see that document. Here it is on the left. Oh, my bad. Let's go back here. Here it is on the left. I'm going to try to give you a close up of it so you can take a look at it. One of, the, one of the other things that we learned to do was translate 19th century handwriting. Let me, let, me, uh, let me share with you some of the recommendations which dispelled this notion that the Jesuits were benevolent slave owners. Number one, let their ration be fixed. In some places they have only had one pound and a quarter of meat. Often this has not been sound. Whether they are to have half a Saturday to themselves, that pregnant women should not be whipped. And how about this one? that this chastisement should not be inflicted on the, any female in the house where the priest lives. Sometimes they have been tied up in the priest's own parlor, which is very indecorous. We became concerned with a financial story. We wanted to tell this financial story. Did the, did, did the Jesuits, did these slave run plantations go into the funding of our school? We hit the jackpot with this document. One of my students found this in an archival database from Rome. It's called the RARI, what's it called? The ARSI. And we call this our smoking gun. This is a simple accounting book. We got credits coming in from Bohemia, 1500, from Newtown, 700, from St. Inigo's, $1,000. These plantations are doing what the Jesuits intended. They're making money. What do they spend it on? How about this? Has been expended since 22 July 1820 in payment of debt on purchase of ground on which Washington Seminary is built. 
$1,066. Gonzaga College High School literally from the ground up owes its existence to the unpaid labor of enslaved people. The last question, were any enslaved people there? I'm gonna to try to tell this part of the story quickly. The rest of this story is there's five enslaved people we found. I'm gonna share the story of Gabriel. The first time Gabriel's name appears in the historical record was from April 30th, 1822, 200 years ago, with a simple line saying, to Gabriel for weeding in the garden in time of recreation. Gabriel was given a portion of a penny, it was a tip, and he's given a couple other tips, all the way up to 1825. We lose track of him in the Washington Seminary, but he shows up at Georgetown College. And listen to this arrangement there. Mrs. Margaret Fenwick by Hillary's wages from May 1st, 1825. Hillary arrived at the college about the end of April, 1825, to the 13th of October, 1827, when Gabe, a black boy from the Seminary of Washington, took Hillary's place at a dollar off a month. This next document on the other side was, was our moment of highest hope. We found a petition, an emancipation petition that, that Mrs. McElroy must have given him. It was hardly a good deal though. Let me read you what she offered him. Negro Gabe, in the beginning of March, 1828, he obtained leave to buy himself free on the following terms. He has to pay $8 every month for his hire and has besides to lay every month something aside until he collects the sum of $400, which he has to pay for his freedom. And then the, the, the document below that is a, an example of the payment. He went out and leased himself. He thought he was going to be free. Well, Margaret Fenwick died in May of 1829, and within a month he sold. Margaret Fenwick's oldest son was a Jesuit. The second oldest son was also a Jesuit named George Fenwick. George Fenwick wasted no time in selling Gabe for $450 to James Franklin Purvis of the notorious Franklin and Armfield family. You're looking now at a picture of the bill of sale of this, of this uh, I mean, this, this is a shocker. You're looking at the sale, bill of sale for a human being. And then my students found out the exact ship that they put Gabriel on after they held him at the slave pen in Alexandria. And how about this? The name of the ship, you can't make this up, the United States. Gabriel arrives in New Orleans, in November of 1829, and this is the final mention we have of Gabriel in the historical record, where he, he along with the 30, 34 other enslaved people, have been notarized. Gabriel's name appears at the top of the list. Gabriel Negro, five foot three, 21 years of age, valued now $700. Buy cheap in the Upper South, sell high in the Deep South. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right now with that. I just want to finish with, with how my students have grappled with this. And, I, and this, this is the real powerful part of the story, I think. It's been challenging for our school to deal with this. But who's been leading the way? Students have been leading the way. I want to tell you a quick story here about one student, and then I'm going to finish by reading two poems. I can't get the tab to go up here. Let me see. Must be that donate button there, make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, da Daniel's coming to the rescue. I told you, I'm that guy. I'm that guy. I just can't get the tab to show that, that, yeah. that other picture. Yeah. I'll start to tell the story. I, I taught a student named Caleb Williams make that picture big. There we go. Caleb was uh, in my class. I taught him for two years. And Caleb was being recruited to play football at the LSU. He's one of the, he was one of the most highly recruited players that year in the country. Before he went on his recruiting trip, he came to me and said, Mr. Donnellan, are there any historical sites I can visit down in Baton Rouge? And I said, Caleb, if you really want to dig deep, there's a town called Maringuin, about a half hour outside of Baton Rouge. And that's where all the descendants of the people whose names he's holding reside. How would you like to meet some of these descendants? How would you like to listen to their story? He said, Mr. D, set it up for me. So he went down there. He spent an afternoon with a woman who was a descendant of one of the enslaved people on that list. She took him to the cemetery where several of these people are buried. And you can see what he brought back to me, a jar of soil. This, this, is, this is how students grapple with it. 
Students are leading with this. They're not following. All right. The other thing our students have done is write poetry. And we need the arts to deal with this. We need writing, we need music. And my students wrote incredible poetry. And I'm just going to finish with these two brief poems, and then I'm going to be done. This poem was written by Joseph Wete. Joseph's a senior at the University of Oklahoma. I dug through dirt. You smelled the flowers. I wiped soiled tables. You sat and laughed. I was tipped. You were entitled and gifted. I prayed, you prayed. The garden grew. I could not. And this last poem was written by Winston Leslie. And it's called Gabriel's Alma Mater. Cane filled love echoes ever proudly across your purple and white line scars, your own stigmata. My brother Gabe wears shackles, not vans. My brother Gabe packs brick, not tobacco. My brother Gabe sings sorrow, his own alma mater. Hail Gabriel, march on. Trust our teachers, trust our students. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Shakima Thumma, who is the founding executive director of IFB Academy of Teaching and Technology in Atlanta. Uh, Shakima is, uh, is an educational leadership doctoral candidate at Arkansas State University Jonesboro. Uh, many, with many research in interests, including black language, African-American pedagogical excellence, narrative inquiry, and fugitive pedagogy. Her work has appeared and been published in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, Language Magazine, and English Journal. Her work inside the secondary classroom was featured on CNN. In 2017, uh, Shakima founded um, the IFE Academy of Teaching and Technology, a K-12 virtual school that prepares students for careers in, in teaching education and her life's greatest achievement is being a wife to Deontay Dunlap and a mother to their blended family of five. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I feel like I wisely yielded some of my time. What you had to say was so profound, right? And I think what was most profound is that you were the one saying it. People like me, people like Kevin, can talk until the cows come home. We've been talking since the first enslaved person got off a ship in this country. But when people like you speak, that's when actual change happens. So I think that that was, I hope you got what he was putting down. <laughs> so I come to you today um, as an English teacher by trade, but I think if I had to choose anything else, I would have been a historian. And I think the beauty of teaching English is that you actually do get to teach both, right? There's no way to separate um, our novels and our, our any genre of literature with, without um, also analyzing and recognizing the importance of the historical context from which it happens. And nothing is written in a vacuum, right? So when we teach, novels are really almost like a cultural artifact that we use to help our students examine a specific, a specific time period. Um, if I were to write about anything taking place right now, it probably would be more like an Octavia Butler novel, yeah. right? <laughs> Remember Octavia Butler, who told us that Make America Great Again would be a slogan? And now here we are. That wasn't new. Octavia Butler gave us that in a novel. A Black woman, Afrofuturist, OK? So I come to you today. Um, as a member of the National Council of Teachers of English uh, Standing Committee on Diversity and Inclusivity. And I want to talk to you about what we believe about students' right to read, okay? And so this is about how English teachers and social studies teachers can collaborate, right? Because there's safety in numbers. And I wanna to talk to you about cultivating academic activism communities. How do we get this done together? Okay. 
A word on censorship. When truth is replaced by silence, the silence is a lie. You cannot replace truth with the absence of it. Even the silence is a lie. And so I wanted to challenge us today to think about what we've been lying about by not saying anything. Right? If we are talking about conversations about liberals, conservatives, and I don't hear the word racism, there's some silence. And it's in it, there's a multitude of sound, but there's also plenty of lies to be told. So I'm going to triangulate this thing a little bit. And the first thing I want to talk to us about is squatting up. Okay, making a literacy collaborative. And I want to talk to you about how to be deliberate and strategic about partnering with the English teachers in your building to make sure that you create cross curricular units that teach everything that students need to know. I created um, FA Academy and the IFE is for inspiring future educators because I understand that we don't do anything in silos. If I were to ask you how you function through the day, you would never say to me that you only do English from 11 to 12. You would never say to me, well, I don't use a calculator unless it's two o'clock on Thursdays because that's when I have math. You do all the things all the time in order to get the job done. And that's what it's going to require of us in this season. So NCTE released a statement and they have been doing this since 1950, right? So we heard about McCarthy. This inspired a lot of um, work by the National Council of Teachers of English and they created an open letter to our country from the organization. The right to read, like all rights guaranteed or implied within our constitutional tradition, can be used wisely or foolishly. In many ways, education is an effort to improve the quality of choices open to all students. But to deny the freedom of choice in fear that it may be unwisely used is to destroy the freedom itself. This is a policy statement from the National Council of Teachers of English. It's available on their website. Social studies teachers are also free to use any policy statement that English teachers have available. It's a national professional organization for educators. So if you have not taken a look at the position statements, the policy statements that we have available, please take a moment to do so. Give your English teacher. You'd be surprised that they might not even know what the organization represents and what it stands for. We got a delay on the clicker. All right, so freedom through solidarity. So I've given you some examples of things that you could teach and pair American literature with US history. One of my favorite courses to teach is AP language because it actually uses primary source documents all the time and it's focused on informational text and rhetoric. American lit is the perfect thing to pair with that. So we're talking about slavery today, right? So Toni Morrison's Beloved and Toni Morrison's A Mercy, both of those, have also been used on the AP literature exam. So if you're saying that you're preparing students for college, you could double it up by saying I'm preparing them to take the AP exam. Primary source documents that partner well with those are the case of Margaret Garner. Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad could be partnered with stories of the Underground Railroad specifically in Ohio, and that's also where Beloved takes place. Stories about William Steele. And then here's one of my other favorites. A lot of people have never heard of it. Dara Horns, All Other Nights. That partners well with U.S. Grant's Jewish removal order in 1862. Most people who teach English and maybe even social studies have no idea that Grant removed the Jews from the South the night before Passover. And so Dara Horns' novel is a historical fiction that talks about Judah Benjamin and people who were just all kinds of people who collaborated in the assassination plot to kill Lincoln. And so she asks, what's different about this night than all other nights? And those of you who are familiar with the Passover Seder know exactly where the title comes from. So Harriet Jacobs' incidents in the life of a slave girl could be partnered with anything in Crash Course Black American History. Clint Smith is a national treasure. If you have not taken a look at that, I encourage you to do that as well. 
one of the things that um, I did as a teacher, I was teaching in Clayton County Schools um, out in suburban Atlanta, and I won the Milken National Educator Award for the state of Georgia in 2011. It's called the Oscars of Teaching, and it comes with a $25,000 unrestricted prize. So I used my money to bring in speakers for my students. One of the speakers that I brought in was James DeWolf Perry. How many of you are familiar with the DeWolf family? Good. Okay. So we, we purchased a screening of Traces of the Trade, and we actually brought in James DeWolf Perry to come speak to my students. That was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had as an educator. And today, my students are 30s, and they're still saying that they can connect with James DeWolf and talk about his, his testimony before the Senate about slavery and reparations. His family, um, according to him, is responsible for bringing at least, um, there are at least a, a million black people in this country who are the descendants of the people that his family brought in. And most people have never heard of Thomas DeWolf. So there's so much hidden history that can be uncovered and American literature and US history are the perfect way to do it. So the second part of the triangulation is NCTE Center for Intellectual Freedom. And again, they've been protecting students' rights to read since 1950. So I put some of these on the table outside for you, okay? Because it's easy to remember if you have a little bookmark, we're, we're English teachers. Mm -hmm. And on the back, it talks about how you can get involved. This is beyond just English teachers. They encourage you to write a rationale for why you'd like to see a certain book included. Um, you can join the rationale review team to be a part of how we review books across the country. Um, stay informed about your local and state legislative policies, and you can donate. And the fifth thing you can do is email them just to get additional information. So if you are facing a book challenge, this is who you contact. Do not try to go it alone. They've been doing this since 1950, and they're here to support you, okay? All right, so here's how you request assistance from them. So in early 2021, NCTE advanced our intellectual freedom commitments by adding a robust assistance hotline for members. To access the hotline, you can email intellectualfreedom at ncte.org. The staff will work with you to offer confidential information, guidance and support, and next steps in accordance with NCTE's resources on intellectual freedom in the classroom. They will respond within 24 hours. Help is available. The last thing I want to say is take direct action. So what do you know about your local school board policy? One of the things that I decided to do was run for my local school board. I'm actually up for election right now. Thank you. <laughs> the school board represents the community's voice in public education, providing citizen guidance and knowledge of the community's resources and needs, and board members are the policymakers closest to the students. So get involved. We need more educators on the school board. One of the things that people were saying in my small town in Texas, well, she keeps talking about literacy. I would vote for her if she would talk about something besides literacy. Texas is like 49th in the nation in literacy. But part of what happens is when you actually go to school and get a high school diploma and somebody tells you that you know, you think you know, right? And so when somebody else comes in and says there's really so much more that's out there, the first reaction is that cognitive dissonance. So please, please learn about your local board policy. If you can't run, help endorse candidates who can run, canvas for people, advocate for people, create watchdog organizations in your community that can check the local school board, but by all means, do something. Our, our children are counting on this. Thank you. Next up is Kevin Satan, and Kevin is a teacher, uh, a public school teacher for 27 years first as a social studies history teacher, and for the last six years in, as a librarian educator. Um, Kevin has an undergraduate degree from Howard University, a master's degree in education from the University of New Haven, and is presently working on his divinity degree from the Chicago Theological Seminary. Um, Kevin has served on the board of directors for Connecticut Council for the Social Studies, and serves on the board of directors of the Connecticut Coalition for History, and is a, receipt, uh, a recipient, excuse me, 
of the 2023 Odyssey Fellowship for Interfaith Study in the United States in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, Kevin's greatest accomplishment, accomplishment is being a father to his daughter as a freshman at UConn. And for those that are from the other side of the world, UConn stands for the University of Connecticut. I, mean, I hope you're all aware of that. But uh, so, Kevin, take it away. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm just waiting for Dan to fire up my PowerPoint. Awesome. So, oh, there we go. So as a librarian, um, you know, I deal with literature specifically now. So I wanted to use J.R.R. Tolkien to kind of summarize our plight currently and how that really connects to a lot of what's been spoken about. So basically, I'm, I'm at a point in my career, and I saw some of the newer teachers spoke yesterday, where I believe in strategy, not speeches and tactics over talking so basically when you see me i'm kind of there for the fight so uh, what we're dealing with now is really a situation that uh, gloria uh, latson billings talked about yesterday when she showed the map of all the places that are attacking crt and putting policies forward and I know from Dr. Jeffrey's extensive work on civil rights, you really have to treat it like a battle map. And those of you that are Civil War historians, and really that's what they're doing. They take, they've taken it school board by school board, district by district, state by state. I just was uh, informed this morning that Maryland is in play. So, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. So our quest begins here. It was about six to eight months before the Virginia gubernatorial election. And I can't say who, but I was talking to a very high up politician about the assault on critical race theory and what that was going to mean to us as educators. And I kept, I basically begged and pleaded with this person. I said, you have to get in front of this. You have to talk to your colleagues. You have to talk to your constituents and get in front of this. And he basically looked at me in the same way as my daughter looks at me when I talk to her about dating. <laughs> he basically looked through me. And, and I said, if, if you don't, we're going, you know, we can't take these kind of losses. And all of our scholars and historians that have spoken have talked in depth about how this is not new. This, is, this isn't new. So, you know, I, I tried to reach out, but, you know, obviously I think Virginia is maybe 45,000 votes around that, that, that was the loss. And, you know, we saw in the news the whole thing around critical race theory and people going into boards and them needing police presence and, and having to escort people out. This, this has been ongoing. So let me move that up. The, the precious, right? Critical race theory. Now, I'm a Gen Xer, and being a Gen Xer, the multicultural, multiculturalism movement starts when I'm basically a freshman in college. Derrick Bell convenes like the first conference on what is critical race theory, and that's 89. So as a grad student in educational in a master working in a master's program, nobody ever talked about critical race theory. Why? Because it's a legal theory. We do learning theory in education. And it's amazing to me, like I watch all these things on CNN and everybody's, you know, they're going at Kimberly Crenshaw and Gloria Lassen Billings and, and oh, 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 and the teachers and the teachers. And I'm like, hey, you might as well talk to me about farming equipment or something like that's not what we do. We only do learning theory. And, and every teacher here knows that's all we've ever done. We've never had a course where I don't know, maybe now, but I seriously doubt if anybody who's taken ed courses has said, oh, we're going to do a course on critical race theory. 
you know, you can do it with outside organizations, but that's just not what we do. So it's the precious, it's, they're chasing after that. So the assault began. So I watched from my delusional safety of the library kingdom <laughs> as all the social studies teachers and the English teachers took a beating. And in my school district, it was a situation where they were being told by administrators. Uh, Mr. Crawford spoke about this yesterday. They were being told, all right, you need to pull these books. This is what you're going to teach. This is what you're not going to teach. And so I'm running around to my colleagues in library media saying, you know we're next, right? Because I'm a former history teacher and I understand book banning is coming right around the corner. Everybody's like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. And I'm telling people, you know, to use a Lord of the Rings analogy, it's like when the orcs are lining up outside of Helm's Deep. You see them out there and, you know, and, and somebody spoke about why progressives have such a difficult time. You're trying to ne negotiate with orcs. You're trying to reach across the aisle and let's debate and let's talk. Let's hear what they thought. They're not here for that. Your, your destruction is what they're, they're here for. I know Dr. Jeffries will appreciate this. We Shall Overcome doesn't work with orcs. Okay? You have to contextualize what you're, what you're dealing with. And so I kept pressing my district. I said, what defense do we have? Do, you know, do we have walls? Do we have a moat? You know, what are we going to do? We have a bolted door. They're coming. I, I, we, I, we see them right there, and we're watching them take state by state by state is falling. You know, Florida, you knew once whatever happened with the election, you're like, okay, I pretty much know what this is. You know, and then it just, it just goes everywhere. So, yeah. oh, there we go. Hold on. Go to this slide thing. Yeah. So, as the orcs of intolerance came and they turned their gaze upon me, there was a surprise arrival at the gate. There we go. I won't say their names, but I know they'll appreciate this because they've seen this already. My co-librarian, who I refer to as the Elf Queen, <laughs> And one of the other librarians, our liaison, who I call Gandalf, they provided me with, with weapons. And I'm going to show you the weapons. It is my sincere hope that every teacher, administrator, progressive person in this audience looks at what I'm going to show you and realizes the utility in it. Everyone online, I'm going to show you what we had in place in a, in a moment. And like I said, this is a foe that's relentless, well-funded, adept at strategy, and fearless. We haven't done anything to make them want to back up and say, mm, maybe I shouldn't go after the teachers like that. And there we go. So we can show the, uh, the documents now. And I'll show you what we have. All right, awesome. Can you scroll down, Dan? Okay, you scroll down, go back up a little bit to the first, yeah, the list, the first list. All right. In my district, and this is all based on the Island Trees versus Pico case from 1982 that says, I, as a librarian, according to the Supreme Court, for now, have autonomy over building our collections. Once again, this is like Helm's Deep, you know, Roe v. Wade was a Helm's Deep situation. Yeah. Affirmative action now, that's a Helm's Deep situation. So right now, they haven't funneled something up through the circuit so they can undo this. But for now, I have these protections in place. And can you scroll down a little bit, Nan? Because this is a very comprehensive document. Yeah, we'll go down to all the way down to the next list. There you go, A, B, C, D, E, F. So the, this is all about criteria. The re, this is my school district has this. And this is the point I'm making. 
Every single person, we talk about how we're going to fight. Every single person should be asking your school district and your board of ed, do you have something like this? That, because, and it's bipartisan because it's, do you want to get sued? Because if you don't, that's what's going to happen. And what we're hoping to do is take it another step further. I have all these protections as a librarian. I went into our staff meeting and said, well, what about the English teachers and the social studies teachers? Why don't we have something like this for them? Because right now, somebody can just walk in and say they don't like what you teach. And the next thing you know, you're sitting in front of an administrator, and especially if you're non-tenured, you basically know. You know, even if you're tenured, you know it's going to be Muhammad Ali, it's going to be float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But if you're non-tenured, you know basically they can just give you your walk the next day. Later on that day, after the meeting, they can say, uh, we don't think this is a good fit for you. Off of something the parents said. So, and I'll end with the uh, website. You have the website, Dan? The website came from the Elf Queen, <laughs> my colleague. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. You, you really need to write this down or take a photo of this or look this up and save this in your favorites. Like, seriously. This is. This is the orcs. This is their, their main weapon. They've already done the legwork. So if you click on start now, and scroll down, there you go. A through Z, take your pick. Let's, let's do the bluest eye just so people can see, because um, Shakima brought it up. If you go up to search and type in bluest eye, or it might be under B, B or T. Is there? There it is. Scroll down. Keep going, keep going. Because you need to know what you're up against. Ranked, warning, oh, keep going, oh, it gets better. There you go. They have gone through it. So you can stop there, Dan. Page by page. So our policy says you have to actually have read the book. You come before us, we go up before a committee. I'm on the committee. So, you know, if it's Toni Morrison, you're coming into my wheelhouse, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be Mike Tyson in the 90s. You face me intellectually. So, but all these organizations we've talked about that are so well funded, they've done the legwork already. They're all the way out. Somebody mentioned it. They're all the way out in front of us. So if you haven't read the book and you don't know anything about Toni Morrison, you just print that out, show up at the school, and say, I want you're taking Toni Morrison out of this teacher's classroom. And or the lawsuits come in the story. It's done already. So my final thought is, you know, I'm more than happy to share information and talk to people when this is over. I'm more like Gimli, you know, the dwarf. <laughs> I'm old, I'm crotchety. But you put me in the battle, I'm going to be swinging the axe. I'm, I'm, I'm here to fight. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Misty Compton. And Misty is a grade seven social studies teacher for 22 years. Misty, you're just a kid here. Yeah, but, uh, who lives with her family in New Boston, New Hampshire. She currently serves as board chair for Rise of Peace for Education and is a member of the Education Committee with Racial, with racial Unity Team of New Hampshire. 
She's involved in activities with the National Education Association of New Hampshire, volunteering with education related committees, serving as a representative at their National Assembly, and working with their leaders for Just Schools program. In 2020, Misty was the recipient of the Krista McAuliffe Sabbatical Award through the New, Jer New Hampshire Charitable Foundation to enhance the work of leaders for just schools throughout the state. Missy Crown. Thank you. Some great teachers get asked to do this all the time. <laughs> Going to be really polished. All right, is that working? Fantastic, and thank you, Daniel. Let me see if I can do this. Um, so, and thank you for the introduction. It really is an honor to be here, and and it feels like I have friends, you know, amongst these groups. And I just wish it could be like the show where it's like Central Perk, and we could just be together all the time, like having these conversations. But I will just really enjoy this right now. And I'm going to go fast because our time is a little bit less. So. Um, I really want to start my chosen story with my involvement in um, the and okay, thank you in the Leaders for Just Schools initiative um, that Stephen mentioned. So in 2019, I was tapped to be one of five participants from New Hampshire who would begin this national effort. We were introduced to Leaders for Just Schools curriculum, which was created by educators and for educators for the purpose of diving into educational equity, investigating how bias impacts teaching and learning, um, exploring basically ways we can improve school culture um, so that every student had the opportunity to succeed. Um, I was well aware that these topics were truly worthy of time and energy and consideration like before Leaders for Just Schools program uh, and their workshops, but the way they delivered the content I know it was spoken of as kind of a spooky thing um, by some of the groups earlier, um, was you know a four to five day period with other educators from around the country and we got to share our experiences and we had thought provoking conversations and it helped us to better connect to our own experience and it was really no small thing that while they, we were there you know having these conversations about educational equity um it, there were two racially motivated uh, mass shootings in the country at that time so we felt the gravity of that we felt the general uh, unsettling shift around Charlottesville, which was just right in the rearview mirror and the DeVos, you know, type privatization um, efforts and a rise in hate groups. And it, and it really did bring me to a new level of commitment um, as a teacher to ed justice work. And we all know a year after this, uh, more of a spotlight's placed on the nation's need to confront racism and schools were starting to add in more DEIJ efforts. Um, but zooming back to 2019, um, we gathered this teacher group to better our knowledge of historical, legal, educational tools to transform policy and practice. Um, and so to further the work in New Hampshire, I won the, um, I was the recipient of the Krista McAuliffe Sabbatical Award from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation um, to promote the Just Schools movement. Uh, so it was really exciting time for me. I got to, you know, step away and just really explore and reflect on what I thought were positive and healthy you know, meaningful goals that were um, human focused, you know, so that we could respond to social injustice within our schools and the broader community. Let me see if I can get this going. There we go. Um, you know, we uh, also had a chance and we really hoped that we'd be able to partner with educators and community groups to support this mission. And that part ends up being like hands down the most important aspects of how I structured my time um, during this sabbatical. And it all just kind of sounds like good practice, right? These are things that a teacher, um, you'd hope that they would do, that they would continue learning and, and to better the craft. So, I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? No, nothing did. Everyone trusts us and it's a happy ending and we all held hands. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so you can probably imagine where this is going. Um, so the work was intense, right? We had, we had a big year in 2020 and um, in January of that year, I really valued the support that I had with many of the partner groups that we um, had allied with because um, my phone was blowing up at that time and people are telling me, you know, Misty, you need to, you need to take a look at social media and see what's happening. Um, I discovered uh, in January of the sabbatical year that they had mailed this out um, as part of a school board election. Um, 
And it read, and one person um, running, by the way, as a couple, uh, was already a state legislator. And it read, right now, a teacher in Derry is training to change our social studies curriculum to teach critical race theory, a Marxist ideology, in our schools with no community input. And it went on about how we should put academics first and um, you know, for their big financial investments and other such things that express like a really high level of fear, but not a huge level of knowledge uh, about what we were really facing uh, in the education system that I've worked in now most of my life. So um, a particular group of, of local conservatives um, would continue to come to school board meetings and at the microphone, you know, time and time again for months, kind of insinuating things about my work and, you know, getting that public spectacle going. Um, and, you know, it's the first time I'd really ever been questioned about anything um, I was doing in, in that sense, um, and especially uh, anything social studies related. So it was interesting, they had used websites um, that really didn't have anything to do with my work, you know, similar to what you were saying, um, Kevin, that it just, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't what they were projecting it to be. Um, and I also found out that in the flyer that has the, um, that I had up there, one of the women who is, who is a legislator um, was also on the board of New Hampshire Moms for Liberty. And they were offering later on, you'll find out a $500 bounty to turn in any teacher, report any teacher to the teacher tattle line, right? That was um, going to um, break, um, you know, a particular law uh, that would um, eventually be passed. Unfortunately, they did lose the school board election, um, but a, a law known as HB2 did pass in New Hampshire. It's what we call the banned concepts law. So it unconstitutionally chills discourse on race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, gender identity in public schools and public workplaces. And the language was luckily muted from the original bill, but it still had the same terrible effect, um, maybe worse, I hate to say. Um, and many advocates had feared you know, that that was gonna happen. Um, it made it dramatically more difficult for teachers like me to have obviously conversations uh, with other educators and, and other kids because it kind of goes way beyond the materials that we're using and deeper because um, or even for best practices for DEIJ because the reality is many teachers or administrators um, might be more likely to abandon these efforts right and these important debates uh, because of those unnecessary legal ramifications and the community unrest that those things are going to cause. Um, and, you know, we can't ignore that these are people's livelihood, right? And that this, there is anxiety behind this. Um, and this is urgent because if, if this laws mean that you're going to lose your teaching license and, you know, people are going to be afraid to guess wrong during these banned concepts conversations. Um, and I think we need to be honest, right, that we can't like scalpel and ninja our way through everything that people are going to want us to have conversations about. But um, we also need to understand this is why these bills cannot stand and cannot pass. Um, we have to consider these factors, and I know this has been mentioned a lot when we vote, <laughs> right, and how it impacts the schools and how people are going to um, create that power shift through their voting habits. So the health of our public schools really needs to be a priority. Um, and, you know, you can call it political, I guess, if you want to. But it just seems practical to me because right now we exist in an almost constant battle um, for what should be necessary school funding, right? And how to safely perform our jobs. And if we're gonna progress as a society, we really need to get serious with friends and neighbors and family about the true value of the system, you know, that accepts basically all students right now, right? Students like my son, you know, and he, um, is a young man who's autistic and requires additional supports and resources above and beyond um, many other students that he goes to school with. So the learning and education part, you know, it's really important that we have that freedom that you're, you're talking about for it to be messy. But at the same time, we do need protections because education for all of these kids should not continue to be a mess. And I think the essential flaw here too is that um there is that focus on educational you know equality which sounds good right it, in in some sense but really what it's doing is um trying to keep us in our lane right and ignoring the fact and and failing to ad acknowledge the fact that most of our work is sort of triaging the fallout of things that are largely unequal and that are largely unjust 
Um, and solving these things really could elevate all families and be part of a functional system. So, you know, we, I'm going to skip this one because I think we've kind of covered all of this today that, um, you know, all of these things, you know, it was discovered that, you know, my story was just part of that broader story um, that we've, you know, developed already. And I'll just get to what I think is uh, the more hopeful part. So um, after, you know, the event happened, um, it was really important to me, right, how as I, I'm proud of what we do as educators and I'm proud of the work that we're doing and I'm proud that teachers are working so hard in many cases to do better. Um, and so I, it was really important for me how this was going to be expressed to the broader community. So, you know, going on podcasts like Have You Heard with Jennifer Berkshire and um, holding Zooms with partners. You can see some of them on the bottom there. We have Leaders for Just Schools, our teacher union in our state and national. Um, educating for good. And we held a day of action for the, with the Zin project as well and tried to spread the word, trying to get um, the, the original bill um, you know, to be defeated that eventually becomes uh, HB2, the banned concepts bill. So you can see a lot of partner organizations working together. Um, and it was, it was inspirational um, to have people come out and really just speak on behalf of educational freedom um, and, you know, being able to teach truth and being able to tell these, you know, stories um, about people in our community and the real experiences that they're having. Um, we had, the, there's more uh, pictures from the day of action here and the day promoting free speech in the schools. There was like a casket that went around the uh, Capitol building in Concord, if you see in the middle there. Um, and that was one event and then i zoomed over to another one that i had organ helped organize with rise of peace um, and leaders for just schools and racial unity team um, you can see on the right i'm holding that sign support youth and becoming uh, critical thinkers so people really got out they rallied i mean this is just one day um, and and people really started to sort of find each other um, and and to really talk about how much they valued the schools and really start to define what it meant in their in their world um, so in one sense, I'm, I'm urging people to help build a shelter from every possible direction, right, from folks trying to sow chaos in the schools um, who are not in good faith, right, representing actual crises that we face. Um, but people, you know, it's going to be a little bit sticky because the, the public schools always have been kind of that open concept, right? We want people to come in. We want people to volunteer. We want them to, um, you know, have access. We want them to be a part of um decisions we want them to learn what's really going on and you know not, not in a camera gotcha kind of way but we really want them to to understand um firsthand what it means um to uh, have a, a a true um equitable joyous public education um so i know that i just got the wrap-up sign so i have um i don't know like 10 hours more uh, that i was <laughs> i don't know that um, so we'll just say that the work, you know, continues. Um, we have legal challenges to these bills. Um, we know ACLU, our um, teacher association, some DEIJ professionals um, have signed on to fight HB2. Um, we're going to continue to counter misinformation, like Don Bulldog saying that there's litter boxes in my school district um, and that there's no systemic racism in New Hampshire um, and try to get facts out there and elect people who support our schools. Number one. Okay. Thank you for your time. Our next uh, panelist is Stephanie Wager. And Stephanie is a past president of National Council for the Social Studies. Stephanie also works for the American Institutes for Research. And in that capacity, Steph Stephanie has worked with several states as they've revised or written their own state standards. So I think Stephanie has an interesting perspective on this as well. Um, Stephanie um, is now also, besides that, is working as the um, leader at the, at, the, at the Iowa Department of Education, being the social studies consultant there. And she has been a high school teacher She's worked in, uh, in a school in Mexico and has a real broad and overview of education that I think will be helpful. 
Thank you, Steve, and, and thanks for the invite. Um, it's really an honor to be here amongst, uh, you know, not only the teacher panels, but just uh, the scholars that we've had a chance to hear from. As Steve said, most of my current work uh, has revolved around uh, helping states, predominantly states that are adopting uh, or revising their social studies standards in the midst of what um, we have been hearing about um, these past few days. Um, but as Steve said, I was also the president of uh, the National Council for the Social Studies in 2020-2021. I think I drew the short straw for the maybe the, the most difficult year um, to be president. Um, during that time, we had the murder of George Floyd. Um, we had an ongoing pandemic, the 2020 election, the January 6th insurrection, um, the emergence of many of these attacks. And while I was president of NCSS, um, I would get lots of calls from, from the media, from reporters, and they would say, you know, how are teachers teaching about the election or how are they teaching about um, uh, the, the insurrection at the Capitol? And, and I would give a very maybe overgeneralized answer a lot of times, but a lot of times I would say, well, it depends on where they're teaching, um, not just at, at the state level, but the district within a state and even maybe a school within that district. Um, and this is really, you know, um, I think just it just highlights the polarization that we are we are seeing um, in schools across the country. And I don't think that that answer, if I were to be asked that today, um, has really changed much in terms of um, teachers ability to teach things dependent on where they are teaching. <clears throat> so I couldn't be a good social studies teacher without bringing you a primary source. Um, to look at, and I've purposely typed it up to not give away any any details, but I want you to take about 30 seconds and look at this, um, look at this source. Uh, maybe talk to your elbow partner uh, for, for just a, a few seconds here about what year do you think that this document um, was published? It's called 10 Principles to Follow in the Study of Controversial Issues. Um, and who do you think published it? Um, so take, you know, 15 seconds scan it, talk to your neighbor, and we'll come back together in just a second. All right, I know that was not nearly enough time, so I apologize. Um, and again, I purposefully typed this up to not reveal um, too much, but this was actually published in May of 1951. So if you said the 50s, you would have been on track. <laughs> um, and this was published by the National Council for the Social Studies um, as part of our um, Committee on Academic Freedom. So um, I did not find this in the archives, but it was our 100th anniversary not too long ago, and one of our board members did. And I think it's just important to share today. Um, there's many other things like this out there, and other speakers have talked to this, but this is not a new issue. So I think one of the things that we have to do when we're talking about pushback is remind teachers um, that this is not a new issue. Um, if they're not already aware of that, it might seem new, it might seem you know, heavy, uh, but this is something that um, social studies teachers have been dealing with in one way or another and, and other teachers um, for a long, long time. And so I think we have to structure it in that kind of reminder. Um, the, the marginalization of social studies is also not new. And I think it plays into this, um, this idea that we need to, to kind of address today. Um, the marginalization of social studies, particularly since um, uh, the No Child Left Behind Act uh, was instituted in 2001 um, has been most well documented and in particularly this has affected our elementary schools we heard yesterday amazing examples of elementary um, education at elementary social studies and, and, and ela education but that's rare i would say if you know any elementary students um, if you interact with elementary students, ask them, um, you know, what did you do in social studies uh, today? If you ask a K-3 student, 
particularly, they are most likely to receive zero or very, very little social studies or what I would call fluffy social studies. And by that, I mean, we did a craft or I had a teacher say we did a unit on apples and that was social studies. Um, and so you get up to the upper levels of elementary, you might, you might hear a little bit more, um, you know, a, a legitimate answers, but generally, if you look at, uh, this was developed by the Council of, of Chief State School Officers, I was a part of this development, 10% um, of total instructional time, which is probably um, overreported, um, is, is, is the time devoted to social studies. So if we, if we have an issue with teaching uh, true and honest history, but no time to act, it's being devoted to teach it, um, that becomes, you know, a significant problem. And so um, I, I think that is, is certainly one of the ways that we, we need to push back um, is by addressing the fact that it's generally not being taught um, at all <laughs> or very little um, at the elementary level. So just really quickly, just thinking about, so how did we sort of get here? Because my focus today is really as a discipline of social studies, how did we get here? Um, I think for me, one of the things is how we teach social studies um, and history has remained largely unchanged. I mean, yes, there are lots of exceptions. Yes, things like the C3 framework and other things have impacted the profession. Um, but if you go into the majority of classrooms and even when you're talking about textbooks, if we're teaching um, history and social studies from a singular text point viewpoint, we're missing the richness that things like primary sources um, can, can bring to that discussion. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to ask administrators, um, when you think of social studies or history, what three words come to your mind? And the top three answers were notes, lectures, and dates. Those were, that was their mental schema, right? So these are administrators that are supporting <clears throat> teachers and we want them to encourage teachers to go to professional development, to invest in uh, history and social studies. And yet that's, that was their view predominantly of what they saw when they were getting <laughs> instructed in history and social studies and they, that they saw in their building. Um, and so I think that is a huge um, way that we sort of got um, that we got here. Uh, the second thing I, I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but is sort of deep polarization, right? Um, this visual, which you might not be able to see super well, but uh, really smart people essentially looked at the bipartisan bills that were passed in the House of Representatives. I believe it starts in the 1950s and goes to the early 2000s. And where you see sort of the convergence of the blue and red is where there were bipartisan bills passed and where you see obviously towards current day um, is that separation where we're not seeing um, bipartisan bills or rarely to see that anymore. Um, so I don't need to speak a lot about that, but the last point I'll make in terms of how did we get here in terms of the discipline of social studies and the situation that we're currently in is lack of investment. There's a huge lack of investment in history and social studies education. The federal government right now spends $54 per child on STEM education, spends five cents on civic education. Um, so when you, you know that old adage about show me your paycheck and I'll show you what you value, that's, um, you know, a huge problem. And the same with the private sector. If you look at foundations that are grant making foundations out there, um, they're largely not, you know, devoting uh, money uh, to this, to this issue. So where do we go from here? <laughs> uh, because that's the point of our panel. How do we push back? First of all, this is an orchestrated, you know, distraction. I think we all know that. We know from history that when uh, we've made progress, we also get pushback. And so I think it's something also to remind us that, um, you know, this pushback is because we have made somewhat, in some ways, in small ways, we've made uh, progress. Um, the second point is both using both sides language, um, you know, often gets us into trouble. Uh, so trying to move away from that, but also showing the complexity of things that are open issues. A few years ago, I got a chance to um, dig into the Kettering Foundation National Issues Forums, and they do a great job of always presenting three to four sort of ideas about the issue so as not to make it seem 
uh, polarized, change the narrative about what social studies is and isn't, and um, also keep the focus on this is a moral imperative. It's not an issue of uh, sides, it's an issue of what is right to do um, and keep students, uh, keep discussions student focused. I'm gonna wrap up by sharing a personal story um, that's near and dear to my heart. A few years ago, I was picking up my son uh, from school and we were doing the normal discussion of sort of, you know, what did you learn today and, and all of that. And he finally said, you know, mom, we didn't yet, yet again, we didn't have social studies. He was seven at the time. And, um, and I said, oh, okay, well, uh, you know, tell me more. And he said, mom, does that mean that people don't care about the world? Um, and that was a really profound question for me. Um, and I think it relates to why we're all here today is that this is about our students and we are, you know, we are leaving them out of this equation in many ways and we are, we are limiting, um, you know, what they can bring to the table. So keeping it about uh, that and, and teaching a true and honest history is what really matters, if not now, when? Thank you. Our, our final panelist is um, Anthony Crawford, who is an English teacher at Millwood High School in Oklahoma City. Uh, Anthony is a native of Los Angeles. He's an educator, an artist, a poet, a host, a filmmaker, and a public speaker. He's the author of three books, which he nicely noted here, by the way, are available on Amazon.com. <laughs> and he, his highest honor is being able to be a father to a cure car. So, in you know. I'm not going to be like those Baptist preachers and hope for all that time. <laughs> To share some things with y'all about uh, things that I'm dealing with back in Oklahoma, but it doesn't even start in Oklahoma. It started when I was in 10th grade. The only reason why I was in class, I used to bitch all the time in high school. The <laughs> only reason why I was in class because I joined the basketball team. And in order to play, you gotta you know, be eligible, right? So, um, I, you know, I was in an AP history class, which didn't make sense to me being in the education class. At the time, but I was in this AP class and I was dealing with this teacher, his name was Mr. Justice, all throughout the years. You know, I didn't say nothing, so I went to class, did my work, did all I could in order to play. Uh, February came around, and um, you know, February 1st was on the Monday, so I said, I'm gonna black history, you know, I'm like a farming or something with all these black people. I don't, growing up in LA, we didn't learn anything about our history. And, um, you know, Tuesday came, still nothing. You know, we learned, we learned about all the presidents now. And I'm learning that the presidents had slaves. I said, well, I was, you know, but he didn't go in depth about slavery. He didn't go in depth about anything. So February 3rd came around and I said, the class is hey, You know, it's Black History Month. When are you going to teach about, you know, Black History? And, you know, he, he, I could tell he got like upset and mad. And he said that I was being defiant and destructive in class. So he kicked me out. Um, and this was the day I got kicked off the basketball team because I, I flipped the desk like, look at this, you know, and I, and I stormed out the classroom. And, you know, and, that, and, it's, and it's funny because that kind of carried on with me throughout my, throughout my life because uh, when I graduated college, I was working at uh, Douglas High School. And um, first, the principal had me in, in the ninth grade English class. Then the principal did a uh, an evaluation. Came in my class, saw the stuff that I was teaching, because I was like, you know, I, you know, I learned a lot of black history while I was in college. I'm like, why, why don't a lot of black kids know about the Harlem Renaissance, know about Jim Crow, or even know about slavery? So those are the type of things I was teaching in my class. And then he came to my class, and the next thing you know, I got removed from my English law class to an English enhancement class. Um, so then I was still teaching the same school. I was in his English enhancement class, and by the end of the year. The principal let me go. So um, fast forward, I'm working at Northeast Academy, and this is this 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 part is, is crazy. Um, here I am teaching the same stuff again uh, because a lot of a lot of my black students didn't know about any of those things I just mentioned. And by the end of the two years I was working at there, the, the principal at that school 
let me go saying and, and accused me of turning all the students against her and saying that I was trying to start a revolution. And, <laughs> <laughs> and but I was I got banned from teaching the OKCPS uh, district. Like they had uh, on, on my name on the website, it had like uh, you know, I forgot the word they used, but they said I cannot be hired in the Oklahoma Public School District. So I said, oh, oh, oh. So then I went to a private Christian school. <laughs> and guess what I was teaching? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I was supposed to be teaching you know, on every other Wednesday. I, I had, had to do a Bible study with the school at this uh, private Christian school. And I was teaching, you know, like rebellions, like Moses, you know, he freed his people. <laughs> Uh, you know, the Negro from uh, Nazareth, you know, he was there with white supremacy and, uh, you know, they, they let him go. <laughs> um, and here I am now, I'm at uh, Middlewood High School. I'm not even supposed to be saying the school name. I'm not supposed to be a representative of my school, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, you know, and I have a way more leniency. Uh, the principal at the time didn't care what I was teaching. But then, uh, you know, this is my sixth year at Millwood. Fast forward to 2021, and a law passed that really stated that we can no longer teach certain things about Black history in school. So I'm, I'm, I'm here we go again. I'm about to get fired again. Let me go ahead and reach out to the superintendent. I, I, I skipped the principal and went straight to the superintendent <laughs> because I was, I was fearful. Um, she said, don't worry about it. Uh, I got somebody who's going to come and talk to us about it. But then, before he had the conversation with whoever she brought in, um, she asked me to be on the news. I said, all right, this is Because the news came in my classroom, and they said in my classroom, I'm teaching this. I'm, 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 I'm not going to sugarcoat anything about what happened. Um, so they, they made us do the segment again. Because um, we shot that segment on Tuesday, they made us do that a, a different segment on Friday because of the stuff that we were saying in class. So I said, okay, so I got to create a lesson that's okay for, I don't know what I'm doing you know, at this point. You know, I, I'm just following on whatever they want me to do. And I taught a little you know, elementary school lesson to these high schoolers. You know, my high school students were like, wow, we talking about this? You know, I, it was from the news. And after the news, Man, and, and I got the, um, the, the website if you want to watch that um, segment too. After the news, I was getting threatened emails, threatening calls, text messages. I'm like, oh, this is, this is serious. Uh, why, why can't we teach certain things about history in our schools? Why is there so much of an uproar going on in this country about slavery? And I was so confused about the whole deal, but. Um, Fast forward to this year during the summer, you know, I don't know if they do this in any of the districts, but I, you know, I'm not supposed to create no curriculum on that. I'm supposed to teach the curriculum, you know. Uh, they made us do, they made us create a whole curriculum, but everything that I put down on my curriculum map, they excused it. They said, no, you can't teach this. You got to teach something else. You can't teach that. You got to teach something else. Mm -hmm. Now, the same person who, who gave us a professional de development about the critical race theory and how uh, you know, the, the ladies around you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, like you know, she monitors my Google Classroom. She checks my lessons. She checks my assignments. Like I'm being monitored back at home in Oklahoma City. And yeah, I just you know they 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 um, told me that I couldn't teach. Um, Polynomics by Dr. Claude Anderson. I'm surprised they let me teach uh, The Rise of Watching God uh, to my seniors, but that soon is about to be put, taken off because it's some other schools in Oklahoma that they took that book off the shelf. So soon they're going to come for every little thing that I try to teach in my classroom. And it's just at the point where it's like, you know, I was talking to some, uh, some, some people last night from this conference about. You know, we're tired, you know, we, we can't teach what we need to teach, we can't give the students what they need in order to be successful in a society. And they're monitoring and creating laws against everything that we're trying to do. And I'm at the point where it's like, I don't even think I want to teach anymore. Because this is, this is, this is a 
Eastside case, and it's, and it's nothing new. Like, you know, she had she had information that was back from the 1950s. Like, this is nothing new. And so it's just like, where do we go from here? Where do, where do I go from here? You know, as, as an educator who actually wants to teach, um, you know, things that really happen in our society, things that I know that our students need to know. Like, when I teach at a predominantly black school, it's like, you know, it's like probably like three to four uh, the, the Latinos there and two white people there. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I mean, tell me I can't teach these the black kids, you know, what happened? And, 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 it's, and it's just a, such a sad case. And this is why I became a plaintiff. Whenever the ACLU reached out to me, asked me if I would become a plaintiff, and they told me the risk is they could, you know, they could remove my teacher certificate, uh, certification. And I'm like, you know, I got a mortgage, I got a daughter now. Do I do this? Do I take this risk? Do I be the voice? Because it don't seem like nobody else is trying to take that initiative, not in Oklahoma. I'm surprised that we even have a law firm interested in trying to get this bill overturned. So it's 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 scary. It's, I don't know what our society is going to head head towards, but I remember reading 19, I bring this book up every time because everything that went on in 1984 by George Orwell is really happening now. You know, this is the records department and they revise in history. And and I don't know if that sit well with me because I'm gonna always speak that truth. Um, because I'm speaking that truth, I got censored from Facebook. They banned me from Facebook. I said, I'm, I'm really good at getting banned. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe there's a job out there where I can go get banned. I don't know. But yeah, and, and, uh, right now, the case, uh, we're, right now in Oklahoma, there's a McGirt, McGirt versus Oklahoma case going on. So they got the, they got our case on the back burner right now. And uh, we just don't know where we, where we head. Uh, but I know that maybe we're going to be taken to the Supreme Court. We're going to be in Washington, D.C. about the case. And it just, like I said, it just, it's just scary. We don't know where we're heading and what's going to be the result of this. But I just appreciate everybody in here for doing what they can do and doing all they can to make sure that, you know, we save education, we save students learning, we save their moms, you know? So, yeah, that's all I had. I appreciate that. We've got a few minutes. Uh, any questions or comments from anyone in the audience? Please. Now we need the mic for online. Sorry, you're I was like, I have my teacher voice on. Um, I just wanted to ask, just I wanted to thank all of you just because I'm so inspired, um, and I kind of appreciate what you said, Missy, being in these spaces makes you feel like, wow, you have support and we're kind of not alone in this. Um, but I did want to just highlight, I think a lot of times when we have these conversations, it can almost seem like education or teachers are also a cohesive unit. Um, and I wanted to kind of say, heaven's point, what do you do when the orc is in the classroom next door to you? Yeah. Or when they're the person who's evaluating you or your oh, administrator? Oh, yeah. um, how do you deal with that? Oh, yeah. Give my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Grab the mic. Yeah. Hold the mic. Hold the mic. Hold the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Take it off and hold. Hold. Yeah. hold. So um, that's that's an awesome question. So what I what I found is to be very professional in my approach um, in terms of going to battle. So with something like the document that I I put up, if you scroll further down in that document. It has an, an actual chart that someone would have to fill out, whether it was for a book that you wanted removed or a textbook that you wanted removed. Because the way you deal with, with that orc mentality is it has to be as professional. It, it has to be like ice cold because they're ice cold. And they make it very, everything's really personal. And so I deal with people very, very professionally. I have a very simple model in dealing with work colleagues. My attitude is, if you can't say it in an email, don't say it to me. So if you have so much to say, especially about things like race, all right, put it in right. 
Write it down and write it down and send it to me. You, you have so much to say. And I'm almost at a point now where I wish I did what the millennials do, where you just flip your phone out. Yeah. I, have, I have people that I, I tell them, I get close enough to retirement, somebody starts saying something crazy, I might have to start recording. Found the question there. And then there's a question over here, I think. Um, so, Anthony, when you were talking about the Bible and the experiences in um, a school that teaches mostly students of color, I started thinking about my own experience. The school is very similar, um, and we've had similar experiences as teachers and being censored in a way. Um, and you mentioned, you know, teaching in a school of color, why, why can't we talk about these things? And I've been thinking about that a lot. My working theory is that the powers that be don't want to see angry black children who are aware of their history. Um, and I wonder if you have the same like, thoughts or if you think it's something different that's causing it. I, I don't know, just that's all. When we, when we look at history, anytime where a marginalized group or an oppressed group gets empowered to go make changes and to do things, they were all shut down. You know, the Black Panthers, they were drugged and they were infiltrated and they were killed, you know, so and some most of them jail. Um, so I think they know, you know, because we got we got to think about why Herbert Hoover started the um the FBI. You know, they were trying to stop a black messiah from from um, from you know reaching out and making sure that black people were good, you know, making sure that they were empowered and fed and had the resources they needed in order to survive in society. So that's what my mindset is when it comes to empowering our children. Because we never knew, I never knew that education was empowering. I didn't know, you know, growing up, I didn't like reading. Growing up, I hated school. Uh, only time I went to school is when I wanted to play a sport, but any other time I'm ditching school. But I did not like school. And it's, and it's so ironic that I'm a teacher now because, <laughs> because you know, it has nothing, nothing has changed. So but to answer your question, I think that's what it is, just the empowerment and what it's going to do um, to, our, to our youth if we give them that knowledge. Question over here. Thanks. I just want to thank all of you again for your efforts and your dedication. Mr. Crawford, I thought about something with your, with your work with the um, the attorneys. Yes, you are singularly on this journey, but I couldn't help think, and of course, so many other people in the room, and Professor Jeffries could speak so eloquently about the long line of soldiers, warriors who have gone um, before you. James Meredith with Constance Baker Motley, and you're trying to integrate the law school, other lawyers, Arthur Shores, um, Fred Gray, people who were advocating for in a different area than what you're involved in right now educationally but your strength and effort to move ahead on this journey is joining this line of people who have suffered tremendously for the advances you made for all of us and that's what you're also involved in thank you We're going to have to, uh, by the way, thank you to the panelists. And it's, it's, it's time for lunch upstairs. And just so you know, there's a breakout session uh, on the ground in Florida, a professor and a teacher from Florida talking about their experiences there. Yeah, so the session's not happening in Florida. It's happening right upstairs. <laughs> Uh, with Michael Butler and Casey Nadeau, who are indeed from Florida, and, uh, and, and we'll all be there, and maybe we can even finally ask Ed about pushback you got. Yeah,